Good evening, everyone. Oh, we're on. Welcome to the National Museum of American History and to American History After Hours. This is the second in our series where we are bringing people like you all into the museum after we close for evenings of discussion, drinks, food, conversation, and all around history nerding. <laughs> uh, my name is Susan Evans. I'm the program director of the American Food History Project here at the museum. And um, with me tonight are some folks who are gonna talk with us about distilling. And in fact, distilling in America and craft spirits is in the midst of a, what can only be called a huge upswing. So in 2000, there were actually less than 100 distillers in the United States, small, sorry, 100 small distillers in the United States. Those are considered distillers that um, produce less than 100,000 cases a year. And now we have over 700. And uh, distilled uh, small distilleries uh, make up 1.7% of the sales of spirits, but that accounts for $450 million in annual revenue. So something to really look at here. Before we get into this tonight, I do want to remind you all to uh, feel free to break out your phones and tell your friends what a great time you're having <laughs> using the um, hashtag history after hours so they can get excited about the history we are digging into here. So tonight we will be looking at this new trend in distilling and then actually looking back at what this has to do with American history. What's changed, what's the same as it was before, and what can we learn that'll kind of bring us into the future of distilling in America. So with me to talk about this are Michael Lowe to my left here. Michael is one of the co-founders of Washington DC's first micro distillery, New Columbia Distillers. To his left is Derek Brown. Derek is a DC bartender and restaurateur, spirits writer, uh, all around fan of drinking yeah. and also the owner <laughs> <Sure>. of <laughs> also the okay. owner of several acclaimed bars here in DC that several of you have probably uh, spent some time at. Uh, and to, to his left is James Roadwald. James is, uh, was the former drinks editor of Gourmet Magazine and he is the author of American Spirit, an exploration of the craft distilling revolution. So that's partly, partly what we're here to talk about. <laughs> So we will, in fact, be talking for about a half an hour, and then we'll have some uh, time for questions and answers from all of you. So get thinking about what you want to drill these folks with. Um, and then we will uh, waste no more time and go have some green hat cocktails and some food. We will see demonstrations from Mount Vernon Distillery. There'll be objects out of storage, and we can keep talking until the night runs its course. So to start us off, we're talking about craft distilling. But for some of us new to that term, what is craft distilling? And wh why does that term matter? You just got elected. We'll start with something simple. Start, start with an easy one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the 100,000 number um, matters uh, because you need some way to determine, you know, what is a craft distiller, what is a large commercial distiller. And of course, the 100,000 is interesting because, in fact, <clears throat> almost none of the craft distillers make even half that much. I think 100,000 100, 100, gallons. Gallons, okay. Proof gallons, yeah. Um, but only um, of the 729, I think it was, that Discus said are you know, under 100,000, uh, only 17 make more than 50,000 gallons. So it's really, we're talking about pretty small amounts. Um, and you know, why it matters uh, to us, I think, is because we like things that, you know, are made by people we can meet and talk to and, and you know, ask questions of. And um, we want to support local farmers and local makers. And, um, you know, if the stuff is all made in Indiana, and um, nothing wrong with Indiana, it just happens to be a place where a lot of um, commercial spirit is made. Um, just limits your choices and you, you want to know if it's made by your neighbor or by a huge corporation. So when we're talking about distilling, Michael, can you give us a little overview of what is, what is distilling? What is that process? I'll go back a little bit before the still gets operated. Perfect. I mean, basically you've got to start with something from which you can get sugar, some plant material, usually grain or fruit. Um, you have to extract the sugar uh, from it. That's easy with uh, fruit, you just squeeze it. Um, but with grain, you have to uh, process it somewhat. Um, and you'll get uh, sugar in water with a lot of different flavor compounds. You add yeast to that. All alcohol 
um, with just a tiny little asterisk. Basically, all beverage alcohol is generated uh, by yeast. Um, and so you ferment that juice, that sweet juice you've created. Um, and um, uh, once it's fermented, uh, the yeast will take it up to somewhere between 5 and 15% alcohol. You take that beer, if you started with grain, or wine, if you started with fruit, and you put it in a still. And a still is a device that heats that liquid up and takes advantage of the fact that the alcohol boils at a lower temperature than the, than the water. Um, and so as you gradually start heating um, that wine or beer up, the alcohol will start boiling off first, and you collect it, leave much of the water behind, and so the process concentrates the alcohol. It also can do a number of things to change the, uh, you know, the flavor profile and so on. But that's basically the process you know, up until you're doing some finishing. Finishing might include adding some flavors, depending on what you're making, uh, or putting it in a barrel uh, to get some flavors and some chemical processing over time. So how will I know that what I'm getting is a craft spirit? Oh, well, I'd like to add something to that. Basically, uh, and a little bit of spiritual advice, let's put it that way, <laughs> is that there is this technical, you could look at some kind of technical version of what the definition is. And as we were discussing in, in the green room earlier, realistically, there is no legal definition of craft. If somebody puts the word craft on the front of a bottle, that still is no indicator that it is actually a craft spirit. And even if it is up at 100,000 proof gallons, is that craft is debatable. And so I think when it, what it really comes down to is something that you had hit on earlier, is that it's about going to the place, being able to experience it, and you know maybe a little bit of regionalism, maybe um, seeing that it's very hands-on, that the people who own it, the people who make it, that, by the way, that statement about hands-on or handmade is very controversial, if you didn't see the legislation against uh, Tito's Vodka. Um, do you want to talk about that? Maybe, uh, well, maybe our audience hasn't. <laughs> well, yeah, basically the idea is that uh, they're contesting the term handmade because apparently Tito's Vodka never touched a hand, or at least in the current process it doesn't. So these, it doesn't make it a bad vodka. Uh, let me be clear about that. What it does say is that some of these terms that are on the front of your label can be confusing and are, in some cases, very rare cases, they're intentionally so. And I think that when it comes down to what makes a craft distiller, it is not a clear definition, for sure, but it is something that we can look at and say, uh, New Columbia Distillers, you can go and you can meet Michael, uh, you can see their process, you can ask them where they get the grains from, and sure enough, that's where they get the grains from. He puts his hands on everything. I don't know I if wash. that's good or bad, I, that's up to your side. Um, and to me, that's when mm -hmm. we start coalescing on what an uh, actual definition might look like in that, in, in that instance. So. so you touched on regionalism a little. And mm -hmm. so how, um, how might your spirits be different around the country today? And how would they have been different historically, looking at them through our American history lens here? I think to a large extent, it goes back to that substrate that you're starting with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I mentioned fruit um, and grain. You know, obviously, you know, whiskey uh, is what you get when you distill beer. Um, there are other uh, variations, but that's, that's one opportunity. So uh, historically, whiskey was made where people grow, uh, grew grain. Um, rum, on the other hand, is made from molasses or some other sugarcane product. So either it's made in the Caribbean or it was made in Boston um, or Philadelphia, someplace that uh, imported a lot of molasses and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, fruit-based spirits, cider mm -hmm. um, and uh, apple brandy or applejack, um, you know, would be from areas like New York and so on. And West Coast, um, obviously, grapes, uh, you know, in addition to making a lot of wine, you get a lot of brandies being made out there. But those distinctions, I think, you know, are blending a lot. It's easy to get anywhere in the country to get any of those ingredients. Well, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the historical aspect of it, because honestly, when I think of the United States, uh, I think we should have a lot of pr uh, pride in our history of, of distilling and mm -hmm. cocktail making and all of that. I, I kind of sometimes refer to it as the besoted republic. I mean, honestly, uh, we're, we're a nation of drinkers, and we always have been. And um, so if you go back to George Washington owning the largest whiskey distillery of the time, or um, the fact that Ben Franklin wrote the Drinker's Dictionary, 
um, that just lists all of the different terms for getting drunk. Have you ever seen this? Really it's amazing. <laughs> Sir John Strawberry. Was anybody Sir John Strawberry last night? <laughs> um, Recommended reading after. <laughs> Sam after Adams. After hours. Well, yeah. let's not go there. Well. But, <laughs> but I think, you know, realistically, our distilling has been a huge part of, of our country's path. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to see it still is and it still be accepted as that. I mean, I, I, we were talking earlier that there was a piece of legislation in Washington State that, that made this comment that distilling is an agricultural pro, uh, a practice. And so that's what it was for. It was not just for the ce celebratory aspect of it. It was for practical use. Um, and so that means practical in the sense that it was part of the economy of the farm. Um, and, you know, farms then were more diversified than they are now. Um, and it was part of... Um, uh, and, it, and, it, and it was part of our health, honestly, water, before we understood exactly, um, you know, what germs were and such, uh, water was considered somewhat poisonous. So man, woman, and child drank. Um, and so, not that I recommend that anymore. Um, in moderation. But, yeah, in moderation. Yeah. Two out of the three are okay. Yeah, that's true. That, and Fair you, enough. And women, too. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, that economy of the farm and how would that, why would that have been a good economic decision to start distilling if we're talking you know, late 18th century onward? Well, uh, there are two aspects. One, um, you can take a lot of grain and condense it um, into whiskey, um, and it's easier to transport. And number two, it's stable. It doesn't spoil. Um, so before refrigeration, you know, whether you were growing apples, you know, or, or, uh, or you know, rye or, or grapes, um, you, you could stabilize your product and make it available um, year round rather than just relying on harvest time income if you converted your, pro your, your agricultural product into stable spirits. Um, so that's, I think, a large part of it. The transport part um, we were talking uh, in the back, I think we all read um, uh, an article, an historical article that um, uh, pointed out that, you know, a farmer in the Alleghenies in colonial times, um, to get to market, uh, to, uh, you know, could load up a mule with enough grain to get about 75 cents when he got to one of the cities on the East Coast. Um, but if he converted grain to whiskey, he could put about $3 of whiskey on that mule. Um, and that's basically how, you know, before there were good roads, that's really how the farmers kind of made their cash living. Well, now, one thing to add in terms of the history is that, you know, as we continue our long recovery from prohibition, which basically almost killed all of that, um, you know, in, in the 80s, there were literally a handful of people doing what, what you're doing now, but it's become, because of the work of a few pioneers and their work in the legislature to try to rationalize some of these laws, um, that they made it possible to, you know, continue that recovery and get to back to a place where we can use farm products um, to make spirits and have access to them on a, in a regional way, like as you're talking about. So you mentioned that, that phrase, long recovery from prohibition. I think I've been really interested in researching this historically, that almost that, that period prohibition now in the spirits industry is almost looked back on as a very a traumatic event towards American distilling and brewing and um, alcohol production overall. So how do you think that, what lasting scars has prohibition left on the distilling industry? <laughs> Cocktail culture. Cocktail culture? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, yeah. I mean, prohibition did more for cocktails, I think, than, um, so than anything. So it created cocktail I mean, culture. Uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Derek, I'm sure, would know this better than, uh, than I do or know if I'm wrong on this. But, um, you know, but the roaring 20s, the 20s was the decade of prohibition. Um, and uh, and uh, women um, started drinking uh, substantially because it was an illicit entertainment and, uh, and people were going to places, speakeasies, um, where by their very nature, uh, the sort of regular social regulations weren't in place. And so uh, it created a, a really opportunity, I think. Um, opportunity that was not ignored by makers. Um, in DC, 
1923, I believe, um, uh, if I've got my dates right, there were 2,000 stills and um, speakeasies busted. Those were the ones that were busted in one <laughs> year in, in the District of Columbia. Wow. Um, so uh, prohibition did a lot, obviously, to stifle organized legal production, but it generated um, sort of an underculture uh, that we're trying to pick up some of today. Yeah, I think it made it definitely made going out to bars a little a little better because now you had men and women drinking and it wasn't just right. a bunch of old men at the bar. So but that it, was good. Yeah. It was good. <laughs> but in the process it destroyed the structure for how you know how to create a distillery. So a lot of states, yep. Nevada, New Mexico, had absolutely no structure. So if you wanted to do this thing, um, you, you almost couldn't do it, or you had to make it up and hope for the best, um, which is a risky thing to do because it's not a cheap uh, thing to get involved in. But also kind of knocked out some of the, the players before Prohibition. So a great mm -hmm. example is uh, uh, my, my friend uh, Charlie Nelson, who owns uh, Bellmead Bourbon and uh, the Greenbrier Distillery. They were uh, incredible producers of Tennessee whiskey, and their great, great, great grandfather, Charles Nelson, um, was the one who invented the category of Tennessee whiskey. Um, he was the one who likely taught Jack Daniels how to do it. And yet, because of prohibition, which happened uh, in different states at different times, it's important to realize that happened in, in Tennessee around 1909. So that was much earlier than other places. All of a sudden, they had to move their distillery. And if you didn't have the funds or you didn't have the inclination, that's it. Done. You're done. Mm -hmm. And so we lost the greatest, or what was was said to be the greatest um, uh, you know, Tennessee whiskey of its time. And so, you know, Jack Daniels is just fine. But I think it's nice to see all of these other ones around bourbon. So I'd like to see more Tennessee whiskey as well. So know. this is your plea for more, <laughs> more Tennessee whiskey? Yeah, <laughs> well, they're, they've, re they've brought it back now. Mm -hmm. And so that they are uh, trying to revive the, the distillery. So it's interesting to see that people are bringing it back. Mm -hmm. But it's also sad that we had this period of time where it was just all but lost. And what kind of um, lasting impact in terms of regulation do you think that uh, either prohibition impacted or other decisions have created these regulations for us? Michael, what's a, your regulation a, a, As a producer, um, the, uh, it's an absolute patchwork. One of the things- And lawyer. Uh, <laughs> it, one, of the, one of the things that um, came out when prohibition was repealed, uh, the amendment that repealed uh, prohibition also said that states can impose any regulation they want on the production sale of alcohol. Um, and, um, and it's different every place. And it which continues to be, right? It continues mm -hmm. to be different every place. And you've got places like Virginia, we may have a few Virginians uh, here, where the state controls the distribution of spirits. Um, Pennsylvania, likewise, uh, nearby, even West Virginia. Um, so uh, there are, Trying to distribute spirits, it's really um, somewhat of a maze or a, uh, uh, an obstacle course. Mm -hmm. And James, in talking to distillery, craft distilleries around the country, what did you find in terms of how they're working to change those regulations or deal with them? I mean, I think the work of um, people like Ralph Arenzo at Tothill Town in, the, in Hudson Valley in New York, um, who spent... I think as much time, if not more, in Albany than he did at his distillery in those early years. Um, it wouldn't have, what has happened in New York has been a great explosion of really good distilleries and it would not have happened without his work in the legislature. And what basically what he was arguing was that it's an agricultural product and, you, and as a state we want to support our agriculture, um, support our farmers, but also that they should be, that distillers should be on the same a level playing field with breweries and wineries. So where a winery you can go and you can taste, distillers didn't have that option and that was, that really hamstrung them in terms of sales. Um, if you have to go every, if every drop has to go through a distributor, you have a challenge, especially if you don't make a lot of product because distillers want large amounts. Their job is to sell pallets, not bottles. Um, so. And that's been true in every state that I've that I've visited. I think there was somebody there who worked really hard lobbying the state legislature to to do it. Yeah. Great. Well, you talked a lot about um, distrib distribution and selling, and 
I think the marketing of spirits is also something that has changed um, a lot over time. So Derek, do you want to talk a little about how, how that has changed for America? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's very interesting because people very much consider their spirit their identity. And in, in many cases, it's just a, you know, something cooked up in a marketing room. And I think that that's one thing that, that I try to, to look after is what does a spirit really taste like? What really is it? And it, you know, do we really need a bubblegum flavored vodka? Do we really need um, a cinnamon whiskey? I mean, in the long run, if that's what you base your identity on, it's a bit silly. Um, and I think that there are great spirits out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, historically, the way it worked is they didn't even have bottles. You know, if we're talking about the early 19th century, we didn't have bottles. You know, we didn't have labels. They were sold in different, you know, other than little demijohns or barrels. And um, even if you were George Washington, we talked about his rye whiskey uh, distillery. That name didn't really, it wasn't like it George on the front, one <laughs> leg up, you know. <laughs> uh, not, not to say that that's a bad image, but I'm just saying, you know, that's not how they marketed it. Mm -hmm. It was based on the quality of the spirit. It was based on what it is. And I think that as we see this, you know, kind of like rampant marketing, um, and a lot of spirits that are designed in, in, in uh, boardrooms, uh, it's sad for the consumer that they have to, you know, go through and try to figure out these terms like craft and small batch and things that can be quite confusing. And so it's up to us, I think, as uh, bartenders or, or bar owners to try to help people sort through that and find interesting spirits. And I would add the media. I think the media, local media particularly, has done a pretty poor job of explaining... Um, I almost swore, oh my God. Um, explaining <laughs> how, you know, what a label, what a local, all right, so the example I, I wanna give is a Fort Worth company that um, opened up and three months later they had a six-year-old whiskey and the local paper wrote about how wonderful this product was and how it was being made with yeast from a pecan orchard and that's a lovely idea, but they're three months old or even if they're a year old, they're not making a six-year-old whiskey themselves. <laughs> No explanation that this stuff was distilled somewhere else. It might have been delicious and a great price, but if it doesn't say distilled by on that label, you can be pretty sure that the company selling it did not distill it. And I think that's a really important thing to know as a consumer because the big word is going to be craft and handmade. And, you know, in the case of Whistle Pig, which is a, a lovely rye, it says Vermont all over the place. It's, it's not made in Vermont, it's made in Canada bottled in Vermont. Um, but if it says distilled by, it has to be distilled by them. Um, so the marketing and the branding and all that stuff, because of distribution, because you're no longer just going to your local dis you know, distillery or your farmer to get your jug, um, you depend on these words. And um, yeah, we don't want them to be co-opted because we want you to be able to say what you're doing honestly and not have people go, well, they say the same thing as the $10 bottle. I'm not going to spend 20 So that's, uh, that's, that's true. And you also end up, pay, in some cases, you just pay for the marketing. In some cases, they're able to undercut, you know, uh, producers that are doing a, you know, putting forth a genuine effort. And in some cases, they just inflate the price. And you think, ah, it's $35. It's going to be good, you know, because it's not the $10 one and it's not the $80 one. And I think that, that that can be confusing for a consumer because to get to the level of expertise or understanding of a spirit, you've got to drink a lot of bottles of whiskey, which maybe that's not such a bad thing, but <laughs> it I is think a commitment. <laughs> it's a commitment. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we want to fight for your hard-earned dollars. And, um, yeah, so I think that the marketing thing can be a, a bit... There's a, let's, there's a lot of gimmicks. There's a lot of uh, misinformation. Mm -hmm. so. um, so can you talk about, Michael, the, the way you produce um, in your produced by spirit? Um, where are you getting your grain from, and why is that important to your process? Well, our gin, um, uh, Green Hat Gin, uh, starts with uh, soft red winter wheat that we get from a farmer on the northern neck of Virginia. Um, and basically, at this point, I think we take all of the wheat he produces. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, we then uh, will mash that and um, uh, and ferment the uh, distiller's beer that comes out of that process. Um, and then we, um, uh, we do three distillations at the distillery. Everything past the farmer is in Northeast DC. Um, and we, um, uh, 
uh, and we'll do three distillations. We get our botanicals from all over the world um, through some, you know, distributors. Uh, and except for actually a couple of our botanicals are grown in D.C. in my son-in-law's yard. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, hey, hands on. Hands on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but um, you know, and then we bottle uh, that distilled by distilled in D.C. Um, product with volunteers who are you know folks uh, from you know the metropolitan area um, and distribute at this point. D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, but we're hoping to expand that sometime Great. soon. So you are all going to go out and try some Green Hat Gin, which I'm sure you will agree is delicious. But I want to talk also about um, not so delicious uh, craft distilled spirits and what those mean to the future of craft distilling. There are some. <laughs> we don't have to name them. I just want to bring it up. <laughs> it's actually, I think it's actually a bit of a problem right now. I don't know if you agree or if you, but uh, when I first became aware of non-commercial distilled spirits, it was because I was getting samples when I was at Gourmet, and I would taste these things, and I was just like, what are they thinking? Like, for the most part, the stuff was pretty wretched, but it wasn't stuff that came onto the market. Um, and... But, be, but it got my attention. Uh, and then little by little, I started to see some more interesting things and Germain Robin brandies, which I think are spectacular. And I wrote about those. And so people who've been around for a while, but there, became, there was this spirit of experimentation that came out of, mostly out of the brewing world, I think. They were, and they started to distill some of their, um, their stuff. And I didn't love it, let's just say. Um, but I think I have a little bit of a problem with this sort of everyone gets a prize mentality now, whereas like if it's local, then it must be good. It's not always the case. And I think it. I think the feedback, again, I blame the media a little bit, but uh, the feedback needs to be there saying, this maybe isn't the best you can do, do better. Um, so I'd like to see more of that. And I guess, you know, their argument might be that the marketplace will tell them if nobody buys it. But the problem is, you know, if you're only making you know, 60 cases of something, it may sell as a novelty, um, and you may not get the feedback you need. But. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, but I do have a different perspective on that, and, and, and this is what I think about it. Basically, um, I think we have to try to understand craft spirits um, for what they are. I think sometimes you have some pretty nasty tasting craft spirits. So let's take out the bottom layer of the most disgusting, horrible made stuff. Um, that is obviously just crap. We'll we taste them so you don't have to. <laughs> exactly. Yeoman's work. But there are, there are some things that we come across from time to time that are different than mm -hmm. we're used to. I'll give you an example um, that, that is actually elevated beyond what you'd call craft spirit, and that's probably mezcal production, right? Uh, right now, most people, most consumers who have an interest, at least in spirits and bartending, have become familiar with mezcal. It's this smoky, agave-based spirit from Mexico. And in many cases, it is small production, very small production. Um, and it is immediately not something that most people are familiar with. It's smoky in, in some cases, not all cases. It can you know, have some strong uh, organoleptic characteristics. And, and so that could send somebody right away in the wrong direction saying, that's nasty, that's not good, I don't like that. And especially if you don't have experience or you think it's going to be tequila, you know, which it has a relationship with but is not. And so I think that it's important to kind of recognize that what craft distillers are doing is in some cases they're creating something new and they're doing something different. And that's in itself interesting and worth trying out and at least exploring. And so we come to think of our taste as the most important thing in the world. And, and I guess if it's your $12 or $20 or $30, it is. Um, but from, it comes from my perspective, I think it's important to sometimes just kind of understand the context in which that spirit is created, where it's from, and who makes it. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the, the where it's from and what we're doing, I just wanted to mark a quote from your book, James, that uh, Ralph Lorenzo mm -hmm. said. Um, so he was asked, what tradition do you follow? And he said, the tradition we follow is the American tradition of I can do that. I can figure this out, and I can make it work, and I can make money out of it, and I can create jobs with it. So do you think this is um, what's happening now in craft distilling? Do you think that's a uniquely American way of approaching distilling? James? Uh, I think so, because I called the book American Spirit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think, I mean, Europe has a different tradition. Um, so they don't, you know, it's, and it's complicated. I mean, they'll do various tiny batches of some weird berry that just showed up on the side of the road, but they're not doing it because, for, for those reasons, they're not trying to create a business out of it. They just have this long tradition of distilling. We have different traditions and a different history. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do think that that spirit of experimentation um, and trying things and, you know, uh, is great. And, that, and it is something that sets distillation here apart. I mean, as somebody in, else in the book says, you know, if you want a mesquite smoked whiskey, you probably have to look for a craft distiller to make that. You're not going to get that out of the big factory or out of Scotland or somewhere like that. You know, I think that um, Europe has advantages that we don't have in terms of subsidies, in terms of property ownership that has been long held, mm. things like that that make it cheaper in some cases to distill. Here, it's pretty expensive to open a distillery. Um, and it's pretty hard to, go. so I think there is an economic immediacy to it, right? When you open a distillery, you are not thinking, how do I make money 10 years from now on this product, 25 years from now? You think, how do I make money a week after I open, mm -hmm. right? I think maybe Michael can <laughs> speak directly to that. Well, it, it's interesting. I was going to uh, add something, a different angle on, um, on sort of European practice. Uh, we, you know, we get lots of visitors, and I can't tell you how many folks, especially from Eastern Europe or Central Europe, um, will come in and they'll say, "Oh, da 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 da, da I really like, you know, I like this or I don't like that." Da, but my my father used to, you know, and it seemed like everybody. I mean, what we call moonshining seemed to be absolutely standard practice in you know many many households, uh, you know, especially in Eastern Europe, you know. You know, you got some plums, you make sliver bits. Um, and, you know, and so it, it's, and it's, it sounds like it's still going on. And it's illegal there, like it's illegal here. Um, uh, and there are people who aren't sort of, you know, uh, hardcore mountain moonshiners uh, who are doing home distilling, even though it's a federal felony. Um, so we're not recommending it. We're, yes, <laughs> of course not. But, but if you it's, were to but do it. But it. <laughs> it, it seems to be much more widespread or much more embedded in the general mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, do you have yeah. a similar impression? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's much more of an underground. If you are doing moonshine, and it's interesting what we think. We probably think at this point it's like Popcorn Sutton who's making the moonshine and the rest is sold. But um, he was, you know, essentially a hillbilly back in, you know, the mountains doing it, but realistically, a lot of moonshiners are actually in the city making small batches. Max Watman wrote a wonderful book called Chasing the White Dog, where he talks about this, and we were having a conversation about it, and he said, actually, there's hundreds of distilleries in D.C. There's hundreds of them. They're just very small practice, and they're not what you think they are, and really, you don't want to drink that spirit. So I want to, and, and if any of you are those people, please don't tell us. <laughs> um, with that, to turn it over to you, though, I do want to leave some time for questions. So we have two microphones, one on either side of the room. So if anyone does have a question, I invite you to come up to the microphone. Yes, to start us off over here. Hi. So I'm visiting from Portland, which has gone crazy for distilleries. Yep. And I'm wondering where the other uh, centers hotbeds of uh, craft distilling are, and if you see any signs of regionalism in terms of how things are evolving. Seattle is huge. Um, the Bay Area has quite a few. Um, Denver? Denver is fantastic, yeah. Um, Do you think there's a reason in those regions why well, that's happening? Well, I mean, Seattle, when they, when they changed the law in 2008, um, it took off, and Seattle, I mean, I think the urban model is quite good because you don't have to move your product as far, and there are people there. Um, mm -hmm. And the brewing scene in Seattle is so good. It's just natural that, um, like, Jason at Copperworks is spectacular in Seattle, um, and he came from a brewing background. Um, where else? The Hudson Valley, New York. I mean, I think anywhere where there are people and people drinking and <laughs> craft beer especially, <laughs> anywhere you know, find, find it happening. I mean, there are, uh, Michigan seems to have quite a few yeah. uh, distilleries, and, and that's ones. as a result of favorable legislation. Yep. New York is the example that you know, uh, uh, James gave a little while ago. Um, not a lot in the Bible Belt, 
<laughs> um, as you might guess. Um, but Texas has got quite a few uh, distilleries uh, going. Well, I'd like to make a plug for, for this area right here yeah. because, I mean, I think we have uh, Columbia, new Columbia distilleries, 1-8 Distilling, Catoctin Creek, Wasman's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lion's Rum. Um, and we just have a, and there's at least two or three new places I know coming and, up. And, um, uh, uh, of course, Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon, and Mount yeah. Vernon. <laughs> yeah. So we have an amazing amount of distillers here, and I think it's just growing. We're excited about it. I'm personally very excited because I get to go and drink all of it. Not right all of it, I'll leave some for you. <laughs> right in our own backyard. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, I would just ask you to come up to the microphone if that's I can possible. My voice. Okay, I'll I can repeat what it. you say. So you project, I'll repeat. Uh, I'll repeat it. In the beginning, I know you mentioned that there's one axis of an area that doesn't require yeast for uh, spirits, and I was just curious if you could expand that. So there the question, I'm just going to repeat the question for the, the cameras. Um, not that <laughs> there are cameras. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, that's fine. So, Michael, at the beginning of the conversation, you uh, mentioned that there was an asterisk to your yeast statement. So what is that asterisk, and what could make us alcohol that is not yeast? Um, I, yeast, I think, is usually classified as a fungus, although it may be its own sort of thing. There is an, uh, it, another fungus. Is it soji? Um, or soji is one of the products. Um, oh, so you mean like with the, like the black molds? Yes, yeah. um, that, uh, that, that the Chinese and the Japanese yeah. and the Koreans for centuries have used to um, ferment uh, usually rice-based um, uh, products and then uh, create distillates from. And so it's kind of like a yeast, but, but different. Um, and that, I think, is the only um, yeah. alternate to yeast and it, you know, it creates products that probably are a hundredth of a percent of the American market. And does it taste? Can you? Is it markedly different in taste? Um, it does have a different taste, but I can't tell you whether that's mainly because they're rice-based, right? Um, or whether it's because of the particular fungus that they're using to do the, you know, to create the alcohol. In all fairness, actually, each yeast has has its own its own mm -hmm. taste. So yes, very much so. Yeah. Great. And another question over here. And can you also introduce yourself and what you do? Yeah, I'm uh, do? Steve Bayshore, Director of Historic Trades at Mount Vernon and operate the distillery there. And we get to work with a lot of these craft distillers, which is very interesting, and worked with Derek quite a bit as well. But the, the question, in what you mentioned about Tennessee whiskey and what was lost in that period, wouldn't you say the other part about Prohibition was the consolidation that followed Prohibition, and I spoke with Jimmy Russell, who developed all the wild turkey, yeah. and he said that bourbon doesn't taste like it did when he was a boy. Yeah. And I think that's the other injury that I think we lost nuances that hopefully some of the craft distillers are maybe trying to bring back some of that, which I know the guys at Greenbrier are very proud of. But could yeah. you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, that, I mean, in general, if you think about it, right after mm -hmm. Prohibition, you had to have a lot of money to make a distillery. And so you're not going to have the little guys competing to do that. And so I think that now we're just seeing the recovery from that. So once upon a time, you know, uh, there on the bar there was maybe one or two bourbons, mm -hmm. right? And definitely only one Tennessee whiskey. And so at this point, now you're starting to see every, any bar worth a shake of salt needs at least six bourbons on it. Um, and... I guess in the future, you're going to need to have a couple different Tennessee whiskeys. I think it's great for the consumer because then you can navigate it and find out what you like. Um, and, and definitely, we're entering, you know, what's funny is in terms of cocktails, right? Cocktails, actually, I think Prohibition did more to bury cocktails, but it improved the culture. So I, I agree with that point that you made um, because, again, it made it more fun to drink in bars. But, um, but in terms of the cocktails, that knocked out a generation of bartenders who were, mm -hmm. you know, what we refer to as the golden age of bartending, which is between 1850, 60, and Prohibition. Um, but today, I would say we live in the platinum age of bartending. I mean, there's so much available mm -hmm. to us, both the, you know, the classical, uh, classic cocktails and new style that is influenced more by sort of chefs and culinary um, um, inventions. So. I think that now we're in a great age for that, but I would apply that also to distilling, right? We can go to Mount Vernon and we can try something that is made in a process similar to what George Washington's distiller made. And we can see people using experiments like Corsair that are doing all of these weird and funky experiments 
And so we're very lucky to be in this time. Great. So we have time for one more question over here. And I'm realizing we didn't even talk about um, innovations in technique that have happened. So maybe that's, maybe that's distilling part two for after <laughs> hours. Well, that, that, in fact, was part of my question. My name is Peter Alpha. I'm the distiller at yet another new local distillery, Mount Defiance in Middleburg, Virginia. Oh, right. But i um, curious, you, you talked a little bit about the negative kind of impact that the sort of experimentation in the, in the craft brewing industry may have been uh, kind of impacting the, the, the distilling industry. What, what are some of the innovations that are occurring that are, do you view, view as positive in the distilling world? I, yeah, I, mean, I didn't mean to imply that all the brewers were doing bad things. There were just a couple that I thought were strange, <laughs> and they've later, they later made things that were very good. It's a um, growing industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was lot. early on, and I think they were actually looking for feedback, so I think, you know, and I gave them a little bit, but anyway. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, if you like hopped whiskey, there's a lot of hopped whiskey happening now, and I, I don't personally, but I'm, I'm impressed with the, the quality of them and what they're doing with them, and it's, you know, there's a little bit of that that goes on in Europe, but the stuff that, I, that I'm tasting here is, I think, really fascinating. There's one in um, Westchester County, and they have a, uh, their name is still the one, which I sort of cringe when I say, but the, the whiskey that I tasted made from a, I think it was made from a pale ale, was uh, just amazing. It smelled like Gewürztraminer, and it was like very beautiful, floral, delicate thing. I was like, wow. I mean, and that would never ha come out of you know Jim Beam, um, and and it's completely because they're working with uh, a brewer um, to make that happen. And so I, I was really impressed with that. Great. Well, um, I am now the only thing standing between all of you <laughs> and some food and cocktails. So we will um, we'll wrap up here, and we'll hope to see you all uh, next month where we're talking about the um, legacy of Julia Child after the French chef. So a little different, but she still loved a good cocktail. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, we do invite you to go uh, exit the theater. There are two exits, these doors and behind you. There are also two bars from which to get your drinks and two tables from which to get food. So it will be equidistant, whichever door you choose. So we <laughs> invite you to do both. Um, and uh, a special thanks to New Columbia Distillers for providing you with the drinks. And a special thanks to our panelists for coming tonight and having a great conversation. Thank you. Can you open the doors? That went. I guess we're still, are we still on? I know we're still on. Yeah. <laughs>